Hello and welcome to episode three of Children's Pedcast, a conversation about pediatrics with Children's Hospitals and Clinics of Minnesota. I'm Jimmy Bellamy, and today we talked to Dr. Ann Bendel, the Director of Neuro-Oncology at Children's, as well as Nicole Scarrow, the mother of Valiant Vito, 17-month-old Victor Scarrow, who has been battling medulloblastoma, a cancerous brain tumor. And Dr. Bendel and Nicole talk about the importance of forming a strong relationship as part of the care team and provide as well a number of uh, great pieces of advice for parents who are dealing with a new cancer diagnosis in their children or any kind of traumatic medical event uh, or diagnosis in children. Uh, They provide a lot of information for what kinds of questions to ask, that there are no questions that are too silly to ask, or uh, there's no wrong question to ask, as well as uh, information about how to cope with something that really takes a lot of time and effort and uh, throws you off your normal routine. Uh, There's been a lot of time spent in the hospital here for Nicole and her family, her husband, and four boys. And uh, you'll hear all about it, and we hope that you enjoy it as much as I did. Enjoy the show. You have four children, and uh, your third, Vito, Victor, was diagnosed with medulloblastoma is a form of brain cancer and he was diagnosed in august and he was 11 months old at the time uh just take us through uh a little bit before the diagnosis and and anywhere uh through it to up till now um so yeah vito's my third and um prior to diagnosis he was a very happy easygoing baby um, and then in July, at his nine-month appointment, we had noticed he was doing some peculiar things, but um, seeing that he was my third, and I have two other kids with neurological issues that have always spanned out to be something but nothing major, we weren't rushing him into a scan or anything, and we thought we'd wait it out. Well, um, the week of August 17th, um, all my boys got really sick, and but they all bounced back real quick. And Vito wasn't bouncing back. And so we took him into um, the pediatrician the 22nd. And we actually took my, for the reason we took my two year old, because he suffered seizures, suffered seizures. And we were more concerned about getting him on the men because we were worried about seizures. And she took one look at Vito and she said, You know, something's not right. And she looked at his ears and she said, Something's just not right. It's not sticking with me. I'm on a call all this weekend. Call me for anything. So August 24th, I came home from work, and I looked at Vito, who was laying on the couch all day, and I looked at my husband. I said, something's not right. And um, he's like, yeah, he hasn't done much. He's not drinking a lot, too. And we went to sit him up, and he just flopped over. And um, he was on the brink of crawling before this. And so we called the pediatrician, and I remember the on-call nurse said, get him in an ambulance and get him to the hospital. Me and my husband were... A normal marriage, not a fight, but a no, that, who's right? Um, so the pediatrician called me back and she said, Nicole, get him to the ER. And so I still will remember I buckled him in this car seat and I go to put the car in reverse and he gives me his smile. And I was like, I'm taking my kid for a cold. And I put the car in the park and I almost took him out of the car seat. And I said, no, let's take him in. So we got to the ER, we got into a room and the ER doc came in at first. He goes, I think it's viral torticollis, and we're going to do an x-ray. And I said, all right, sounds good. And he goes, you'll probably go home today. And we'll, I said, that sounds great. He came in another time, and he asked me a couple more questions. He came in another time and looked at pictures. And I remember sending a text to my husband. I said, something's wrong. I've seen the doctor too many times. And um, they admitted us under neurology watch. And um, we went up to the seventh floor, coincidentally. And... Um, the neurologist came in the morning. He goes, I think you might have viral encephalitis. He goes, you'll be here for a while. We're going to do therapies. We're going to do an MRI to see the inflammation of the brain stem. And um, then we'll go from there. And I was like, all right, great. So we did the MRI. It was later in the afternoon. And um, uh, to this day, it was. I remember talking to my husband. I said, something's off. I said, something's off. 
And he goes, well, they had to do, because so they were doing lumbar puncture and all that stuff, Nicole. And so the hospitalist, Dr. McCullough, comes by and we see him. He goes, we need to talk. And he said, we got into a room. He said, it's a brain tumor. And our world stopped. And um, so fast forward, we did um, the EVD. They told us he might be going to emergency surgery that night and going the next day. Coincidentally, he was diagnosed that day was his 11-month birthday. Um, September 3rd, we did his debulking. Um, because of the way the tumor was, they weren't able to remove all of it. Um, Vito was in PICU a little bit longer than planned. Um, he experienced posterior fossa, meaning he was, wasn't was crying for a while. He lost all of his skills. We were started. We moved down here. We started chemo. He started regaining his skills. We got discharged for our first time October 27th. We've been in and out of the hospital a lot. He's, he's, he's had some bumps, but he's triumphed them all. Um, he had his scan December 31st, and that one showed that um, we were really hoping it would shrink all the way and maybe be gone, and it showed that the two were stable, which is great, but we didn't know what really it meant. So then we planned to go into surgery January 15th um, to go look at the tissue. Then Vito got, went, had sepsis, then we got RSV positive, so that didn't happen. So then we went January 20th, and we got all the tumor and. It's just amazing. It still gives me chills when I think about it. We did have some posterior fossa again, so we've been in the hospital since. And when Vito came out of this surgery again, he wasn't able to sit up. But if you see him now, he's sitting up, he's smiling. He's he's just an amazing little guy. And it's we're hope we finish. We start up our last round of induction chemo today, and we're hoping to be out of here by this weekend. And we love the seventh floor, but we're hoping to never see them again. <laughs> Dr. Bendel, when did you first meet Nicole and Vito and, and their family? I suspect that I met them within the first 24 hours of the diagnosis of the brain tumor. Do you remember the exact day? I remember it was the next day you all came in, and yeah, it was, hi, I'm Dr. Bendel, and we were amazed that we met her so fast. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we tried to meet the families very quickly because having the diagnosis of any type of cancer is their worst nightmare. And usually having information about what that means um, and what the amazing things that we can do to help cure their child of their cancer is what they need to hear. And the sooner that they can hear that, even if we don't have all the details and we don't even know how curable it is, it at least lets them know what the plan is to get the answers. Vito is uh, one of the world's youngest superheroes as well. Um, he has many capes, and uh, he gained uh, uh, quite a popularity uh, around Christmas time. You have family. Is it in the Chicago area or in yeah. Illinois? Yeah, we have family in Chicago. We have no family up here. We moved up here because my husband's military career, and that was one of the most difficult parts of this because we had no one to call immediately and say, I need you to watch my child. I mean, we had friends, but how we didn't know how to break that. When we moved here five years ago, my husband was DTDYing and deploying, and at the time I was working internationally, so we made acquaintances, but we hadn't put our roots in yet. And um, so, yeah, come Christmas, um, our community, from day one of diagnosis, they just lifted us up and said, what can we do? And we didn't know what to ask for. And we didn't know what to do. We were still, and I was pregnant. I was very pregnant. And um, they said, and then when we found out we were going to be here for Christmas, they said, we're going to get you Christmas cards. And this, it blew up, and we got Christmas cards from everywhere around the country, even around the world. And um, at the end of the day, like me and my husband joke, we didn't have roots when this started, but you're going to need a bulldozer to get us out of Waconia now. <laughs> so, yeah. It's uh does it does it help uh not that you lost it but restore your faith in humanity when you see the outpouring from from people that you've never met and and some you'll never meet yeah it does and me and my husband talk a lot about it because um you know we are so fortunate that we receive all this and at the same time we want to you almost feel guilty at the same time because you have so much kindness and me and my husband really have a rule that we want to live a life that's worthy of all the kindness that's been shown us. And our true goal now is to teach our sons that this happens and this is kindness. And 
this is love and this is faith and we hope that we raise our sons to appreciate it all at the end of the day and I can't we have a huge box that's got all of the Christmas cards and all of the Valentines and everything and we can't wait until Fido is old enough and we can teach him that so many people cared about him that never met him and love him and that's what true love is and that's what humanity and faith is all about so yeah uh, you two have had a unique relationship. Um, I don't want to say unique as in it, it doesn't exist in many cases because I know in your profession, Dr. Bendel, you hope to be able to have this kind of communication with your patients and their families. Uh, but, but tell me about what, what is needed, uh, from a care team point of view. Uh, how, how important is the parent's role in, in, uh, being as informed as as the experts? It's extremely important. Um, I think that you know, there are many things, many words of advice that I would give families when they're going through this situation. But you know, first of all, I think it's extremely important that they understand what condition or disease or cancer their child has. You know, whatever we know about why it develops, um, what the treatments are, the side effects of the treatments, um, the pros and cons of each of the treatments, because if you have that knowledge base, it gives you some control so that you know what to expect, you know what questions to answer. And, and having knowledge just makes you stronger and makes you be able to cope with what's in front of you. And Nicole, you're facing, uh, especially during initial diagnosis, you're facing uh, what must feel like a mountain to, to hurdle. Um, and I, I come from a family of four boys, so I can I can speak from the child's point of view. And I, I oh my gosh, I, I I still apologize to my mom and dad for all the grief we put them through. Um, <laughs> we all made it all right uh, though, and I think I think they're okay with us, but. Um, what what should a parent do um, initially to to establish uh, the role you have in in Vito's care with the rest of his team? Um, I think where we came from, our biggest thing was trust and communication. Um, when Dr. Bendel came in and said, "You know, this is cancer. We think it's medulloblastoma." And I remember my heart sank because, you know, I started looking up a little bit brain tumors and stuff, and medulloblastoma and a lot of stuff for infants wasn't pretty. And I remember Dr. Bendel said, you're going to read a lot of stuff, but know that I have faith we can do this. And that's when I decided I'm not looking up the prognosis and all that because I have trusted Dr. Bendel, and at the end of the day, I know we wanted the same thing. So my big thing is was trust and communication because I know I can email her any questions I have and I've sent her weird little questions every now and then because they were bothering me and she'd answer them and I was able to go to sleep <laughs> so I mean I I think she's very right you need to talk about prognosis and positives because we were debating some big treatment possibilities for Vito in the event we couldn't get this tumor out and I was always very thankful that at the end of the day she answered all of my questions even some very silly ones and at the end of the day, I knew that I didn't have the knowledge she had. I just had my emotions with my son, and I trusted that what her recommendation was, that I trusted it and knew that if we had to make a decision on a treatment, that I could trust with what she was saying and go forward. So, Dr. Bendel, information is, is so valuable uh, when it comes to facing cancer, uh, especially when you're dealing with a, a child. Um, you are providing so much uh, for these families, and in return, what what are you learning from the patients in these families? I learn many things from them. Um, first of all, they are the expert on their child. Uh, they know more about that child than any of us will ever know. Um, they know both about their emotional and behavioral issues, but they also know about how they're doing medically because they watch them every day and they know, you know, Nicole said that she, she knew something wasn't right with him. She couldn't put her finger on it, but she knew something wasn't right with him. And so um, it's very important that we listen to families because 
they they are going to give us the information that's going to help us know what is the right way to treat their child, even even if there may be kind of a blanket way that you treat a certain subtype of medulloblastoma, you have to tweak it based on how that child will will tolerate it and how the family can can tolerate the treatments. Um, so that's very important. Um, I also have learned a lot medically from parents because they do do searching and they talk amongst each other. And I feel like I know every pediatric neuro-oncologist in the nation and I know the various treatments that they're doing. But I'm oftentimes a parent will come and say, hey, you know, I came across this or what do you think of that? And it will be something that I hadn't either considered or I hadn't known. And so I, I do find it helpful. Uh, many times it's not quite on target, you know, and then I can say, hey, that's great. It's interesting that, but that doesn't really apply to your child. Um, but, but I do learn from the information that the parents give me, not just about their child, but some of their medical research that they do. Although I like them to consider me as the person that's doing the research so that they can focus on their child and taking care of their child and their family. Cause at the end of the day, that's really the most important thing for these parents is to not get lost in the diagnosis and not get lost in the trying to cure the cancer and forget to love that child. And for, I mean, not that you would ever do that or any parent really, but not forget. I mean, you've got a family, you know, every day counts and every day is really important if you don't really know what the long-term outcome is going to be. So we'd like you to be able to trust the team and know that we are trying to do the best treatment known for your child and then go ahead and enjoy life. And Nicole, you mentioned you live in Waconia, which is roughly, is it 32, 35 miles west? Okay. (laughs) About west, a little south, but west of Minneapolis. So for for a family like yours where you have four boys, uh, your husband's in the military, how have you been able to... um, manage the back and forth of the travel and the spending significant time in a hospital? And, and what would you say to a parent that that is facing what may seem overwhelming at times? It's ever evolving. Like what we were doing, what we're doing now is not what we were doing in November. Um, it's a day by day process. Um, we have a nine year old who one day will be very comfortable sleeping over at a friend's house and the next day is calling in tears and we need to get him here with us. But then the very next day is crying because he's overwhelmed by being at the hospital. So it's very ever-evolving. Utilize everyone who's willing to help because, for instance, our treatment plans was about six months in the hospital, and we almost used all those days here. And we still have about six months outpatient, and our treatment is going to involve we're going to be outpatient clinic, but we have to be in for rehab twice a week, long days, because we're doing seven sessions a week. And um, ever-evolving, being creative. Like So we turned our room, if you walk into it, it looks like it's a little house. We have pictures everywhere. We have tents up. We um, This is your hospital room. The hospital room, sorry. (laughs) Um, We made it a little house so that when our boys come in, it doesn't feel like a hospital room. Um, We made things fun, so we'll go to the... Target, when they come here, we'll pick up snacks, we'll get movies, and we watch them. We've utilized the Ronald McDonald room where it makes it like sleepovers, and we try to make it less hospital and clinic as possible because, like Dr. Bundle was saying, you need to cherish every day that you have. For instance, I will never have a 9-year-old, a 2-year-old, a 1-year-old, and a 4-month-old again. That I would ever will. So I need to cherish those days while I have it. And it just happens to be that they're at Children's Hospital. But that's our family right now. And we make it that way and we've accepted it and we celebrate it because that's our family dynamic at this moment. And how has Children's been for you and your family? Amazing. Um, children. So right now we're in cold and flu season, so half of my family can't come <laughs> per visiting. They have worked with us to get us up here. Um, the sibling center has been amazing with my other two. Um, 
volunteers have come so that we, me and my husband can get away because it's really important to also focus on your marriage while you're doing this because you're in crisis mode. End of story. You're in crisis mode most of this. You're watching for fevers. We've had sepsis. So we're bought, battling sepsis. We're terrified of going away. And then there's this lingering thought in your mind, what happens if it comes back? And um, the best thing I ever read during all this in the beginning was you still need to focus on your marriage and so me and my husband still go out on dates because when this is all over I still need to know who he is so they make sure we have volunteers the nurses have helped out with my other kids um I still remember when veto scans came back and we had three doctors well three providers call us and tell us the results the same day and I was crying over it and the nurses just took me aside and helped me talk through it and um, they've children's has become part of our family. And we'll miss seeing them on 7th and um, they, what they've become because, in a way, me and my husband were joking. We're like, you know all the other rooms on the floor? So those are our neighbors. This is our apartment complex, and those are our other residents. And that's really kind of how we took to it. They've, the children's has they've saved my son's life, and they helped my family. That's, they've been amazing. And Dr. Bendel, I imagine that's that's something you you never I mean it'd be perfect it'd be in a perfect world you'd never have to go through any of this but it has to be what you're looking for for a family to uh adjust as best as possible given the circumstances and and it and it seems like Nicole's family has found a way to to make it work for lack of a better term. Yes, very much so. Uh, they are our star, our star patients. Um, but I, I think many of our patients are similar to the Scarrow family. Uh, they just have to be because you've you've got to survive through this, and the way you survive is having hope uh, and being optimistic uh, and trying to get help from the people who are willing to help you along the way, and forming relationships with the people that you have to work with every day. Nicole had talked about that trust that uh, she she would go to you with her questions and you would answer them. How important is that transparency and, and being honest even during some of the most difficult times and conversations? Yeah, it's essential to be transparent because it doesn't do anybody any good to not be transparent. Uh, she is an equal member on the team, as is her husband and Vito. Everything that we know, they need to know. And you know, I think most people are transparent nowadays, but certainly you know, in the past, people have felt like maybe it would be too hard for families to hear you know, the full information. Or you know, if something doesn't go right, you know, maybe they wanted to protect the relationship and not give full information. But that isn't fair to not have a member of the team not know all the information because it's going to come back to get you because then something will happen down the road where it would have been so helpful to know, you know, the information of the prognosis or the information of something that happened early on or someone's idea uh, that you'll just be backpedaling and just it's impossible to to give good care um, and including the parents to give good care to their child if they don't have all the information necessary to do that. And then also you lose trust if you're not giving full information. And this is uh, certainly uh, something that you experience in your career uh, as, as the director of neuro-oncology here. How, how are you personally able to uh, not take work home with you? Is, is it even possible? Is there an escape to just have time to kind of process and, 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 and compartmentalize all of these serious, serious life events? Mm -hmm. Are you able to, are you able to go and, and, and read or, or have fun without, uh, su such, uh, such scary things to deal with? So I would say I do a pretty good job, uh, although I can never completely escape my work because it's too important to me and my 
and the decisions that I'm making are major decisions. And I love my patients and their families, and I worry about them when either a decision has to be made that isn't crystal clear, which happens a lot in medicine, um, or if the child isn't doing well. And so I can never completely escape it because I can't turn off that area of my brain and my heart. Um, But I feel like I do as good of a job as possible in the way that I do it as I have a great group of colleagues that I work with. And so I'm not on call every night and I'm not on call every weekend. And I can choose to keep my pager on and I can choose to look at my emails. Um, But I also know that if there is a major thing, my partners can take care of it. Um, And I do take vacations and I know that my partners and my neuro, we have a small neuro-oncology group that is part of this team that Nicole's family knows very well. And I know if I'm not here, one of them is there to be the true hand holder. And then you know, there are other members that can help kind of put the pieces together as needed. And I'm always, always available if needed. And then I have my own family and friends and we enjoy doing things together and it's helpful to be able to go home, be with them, do fun things, and then come back refreshed so that then I can give my all the next day to the patients and their families. That sounds like a good balance. And, and it, it seems to come with the understanding that this comes with the territory. You know what you're getting into at the start of your career that uh, maybe you can't envision every scenario, but but you do come into it with the understanding that uh, it's it's not always easy to make a clear division of uh, personal life, work life. And, and I, I would say that there are medical careers where you can make that, uh, at least more clearly make that division. If you do, there are some um, jobs where you do, sh- as a physician, where you do shift work, uh, meaning that you take care of the patient that's sitting right in front of you, um, but that you don't have any lasting relationship with that patient. And I'm sure that you do have some second thoughts about things and you go home at night and go, oh, did I miss something or whatever? I mean, everybody has those things, but but you are not emotionally attached to the families. Um, and the people who go into primary care and the people who go into a subspecialty like pediatric uh, oncology you form these lasting relationships with the families. And that's actually what I love about my job. And so the downside is that I can't escape it completely, um, although I, I try to be able to take care of myself also so that I can be as functional as possible, both emotionally and physically at work. Um, but that's what I love about what I do. I love to be able to take a family through their worst nightmare that their child was diagnosed with, with some type of cancer and be able to give them information, help them feel knowledgeable, help them feel empowered, help them be able to care for their child along with us and be able to hopefully cure them. And and if I'm not able to cure them, in the meantime, I've usually made them better for a period of time, given them good quality of time together. And during that uh, that whole process, we tend to form incredible bonds with the with the families, which which we find very rewarding. That would lead me to ask, what kind of questions uh, would would should a parent ask uh, at the start of uh, this journey, and then uh, along the way through? Um, well, I think the first one is how to. Besides, after what's the diagnosis and all that, I think a big one is how can I get a hold of you. Or what, where do I send my questions to? Because you're going to get questions at 2 o'clock in the morning because during those first couple of days, I guarantee you're not going to sleep. So those questions are going to come at 2 a.m. And where do you send them to? Um, and then the other thing is where, where, should I do the, where, where should I look up research? Because you type in medulloblastoma. Websites pop up everywhere. And they're not all created the same. Like Vito's tumor subtype... Like as Dr. Bendel told us, I forget how many years ago, but several years ago they didn't have these subtypes, so everything was lumped together, and so there was no way to differentiate. So one subtype is not the same as another. So 
where should I have looked for the right information? Because if you look at the wrong place, it can break your heart. And so where to look for information? And then when you're in care, what can I do? So when we started this, even in PICU, me and my husband literally stared at Vito because we didn't know we could touch him while he was in PICU. You have all these machines and cords. And then one nurse walked in, she goes, would you like to hold your son? And I was like, yes, (laughs) please. And I mean, it was work. It was a lot of work balancing. And then um, she's like, would you like me to help? Would you like to help me do his cares? Yes. And I didn't know I could ask that because I was so ingrained with we have cancer we have cancer and that's all I was thinking and so ask what you can do to help so like on seventh floor now we do almost all of his cares and I say what else can I do because I'm part of him then because at home I'm taking care of him as a mom you want to take care of your son I can't make cancer go away I can't as much as I want it to but you want to what I can do jitsu site cares I can help a feeding bag I can give him baths and so I was so thankful when nurses came in. They're like, you can touch him. You can do this. And I still remember when nurse came in. It was My birthday is October 13th, October 12th. She goes, how would you like to go out for the day? I'm like, I'm not leaving my son. And she goes, no, go out on pass. I'm like, what's pass? What's this? So ask those questions. and Ask the silly questions because I had silly questions like, will he have a flat head? Because they removed it. I'm like, and to me, that was a silly question, but it was bothering me. And if you walked into our room in October, there were pieces of paper all over the wall because I had pregnancy brain and I couldn't think straight. And we had all these questions. So I'd write a question down. And thankfully, our team and our nurses, if we weren't there, they wrote the answers on there for me. <laughs> and um, yeah, so just ask everything. And I could pull those out and find plenty of silly questions because there were a lot of them. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, I can imagine there's no wrong question, no silly question, or question too silly, I should say. Yeah. I, I read something you wrote uh, to, to New Cancer Moms, a letter uh, on the Huffington Post Parents blog. Has has writing been, uh, has it been therapeutic to you? Have you done more of it this time? Yeah, so um, it I fell onto it. Um, so we started Vito's Facebook page as a... Um, to get my family posted on what's going on because I couldn't make those phone calls. I couldn't talk about them. Um, At that time, it was really hard. I couldn't even say cancer. I had to say medulloblastoma and pray no one asked me what it was. Um, So we started Vito's Facebook page as a real small following because I was going to do Caring Bridge and I have technically challenged family and they had Facebook. They couldn't get to Caring Bridge. So... um, yeah, and it blew up, and then when Vito went viral, it he's all over the country. And I had written posts about Vito going through the emotions and everything, and it's become very therapeutic. And what also it's become that I'm, in a way, honored is helping other parents along the way and getting that circle, because there's not a lot of us who have kids with medulloblastoma as infants, and who've experienced posterior fossa syndrome. And when you go through that, you're, you're, you're digging, finding something. Tell me, we're, tell me what to expect. You need to know. I mean, no one likes being in a dark room. And so I've also been able to be touched with people that way. And I've talked with other parents who've gone through posterior fossa, who've gone through medulloblastoma, who've gone through two neurosurgeries. And it's been very therapeutic and They've given me wonderful ideas for therapy. They've given me wonderful ideas to talk to Dr. Bendel about questions I hadn't thought of. So therapeutic and research, and it's just, it's been amazing. Yeah. And how can people find Vito's Facebook page? Um, Google Valiant Vito, and he pops up, and you see his big grin. <laughs> is, is, that, is, is that pretty cool that, I, that he's, he, he really, I, I said he's the youngest superhero. He really seems to have taken on which is amazing for his age, taking on this other persona. And, and and has that, has that helped you through? I mean, it, it, would it be wrong to say he's your hero? Yeah. All my boys are my heroes. They've, each of my boys have had health struggles. Now Vito's had the biggest, but my boys are made of titanium and they are destined for amazing things. And I can't wait. I joked with our pediatrician before we met Dr. Bendel, and I've told Dr. Bendel's team several times, I can't wait until these boys are 18 and we can hear all the crazy things they've done. And I could sit there and say, 
Remember when they had me in tears? They're they're destined for really amazing things, and it's going to be amazing to see what they turn into. What do you think a look back would look like uh, 20 years from now? I hope our look back is full of love and strength. There are scary moments, but I really hope that if someone were to tell our story, it would be about love and strength, and that's what carried us through. Um, you, you had made, made mention of being able to talk to parents who are going through similar things. Um, how has technology helped you cope with everything? Um, you, you had mentioned also that when you first got here, you didn't have roots and now you have a lot, it seems, uh, has, has it helped that you seem to have at least not, you, you, you seem to have a, a community, literally a community in Waconia, but then this virtual community. Have you, have you ever felt alone during this time? I think that's a tough one to answer. I think, I think everyone's felt alone at one point, but my community has lifted me up in those alone moments and those low moments and helped me cry and held me up during that. And we're very faithful people we believe in. Um, We're very religious at the same time, and we very much believe in the footprints. I think everyone's heard that in your scariest times, I'm paraphrasing here, but it's your scariest times, it's Jesus that's carrying you. And I also believe it's our community that's carried us because we've had very scary moments. December 31st, I was terrified absolutely terrified and going into surgery I was terrified but we were wrapped in prayer and in love and so I think yeah it's not that we didn't feel alone it's that we had a community who was there for us that lifted us and got us through it Dr. Bendel how's Vito doing? He's doing great What's the uh what was what was the news that we heard in, I, I think it was late January, early February? What was yeah. that news? So Vito has a subtype of medulloblastoma that in infants tends to be a good prognosis. Uh, but the treatment for years for medulloblastoma has been chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And radiation therapy is really a good treatment for medulloblastoma, but it has long-term complications, particularly in young children. And long-term complications meaning um, issues with cognitive dysfunction, so developmental delay. Um, that is something we would love to avoid. And so, like we, I had mentioned earlier and Nicole had mentioned earlier, we've learned that there are these subtypes, and his subtype is one that we think is better and could potentially be able to avoid radiation if all the stars line up right. And his stars lined up right. And when he had his surgery in January, what Nicole Nicole had said that we were able to, you know, he got um, four cycles of chemotherapy and the tumor shrunk and kind of changed in character, but did not completely go away. And so we had the Dr. Nagib, the neurosurgeon, um, went in, was able to surgically resect that entire tumor, but there was no live tumor cells there. And that was equally as important. It meant that this was a very chemotherapy-sensitive tumor. We were at a point where we, although we thought there was tumor there, it wasn't. It was just crud. It was just dead tumor from our treatment. And so it meant that he did not need radiation, at least to the best of our knowledge, and that we could hopefully never do radiation, but it's always in our back pocket. And if this tumor were to come back, God help us, and we're certainly praying that won't happen, it's always an option then, but he'll be older, and then he will, what, even if he's still young, he'll be able to tolerate it better. So that, that was our one of many accomplishments. And when is our next mile marker? Is it? Are we looking at September to to see how he's doing as far as uh, being cancer free? Is there? Is there? Every day is a mile marker. Okay. Um, well, we we 
I suspect we're not going to see any more tumor ever again, but we do look periodically. So he will be looked at again. Um, End of this month, we have scans before he hits maintenance. Right. And then he gets six months of maintenance chemotherapy, and we'll look every three months during that. Um, and then when he's off treatment, we'll continue to monitor that. And, and I would say our, our milestones are to get off treatment. Um, that's always a milestone because once you're off treatment, the kids just do so much better. Uh, even the next six months, which will be more mild treatment, he's going to show improvement. But chemotherapy, even chemotherapy in a mild form, it, it, it wears on patients, although kids are so resilient and they do way better than adults. But um, he would he will fly when he comes off chemo. Um, and then I would guess that within the next, you know, I'd say two years from now is a milestone, and then five years from now is would be a huge milestone. Um, and those are kind of time points where if it hasn't come back, it significantly lowers the chance that it's going to come back. And then, of course, along the way, he'll be making developmental milestones, which are also important milestones to see that that the treatments we've done have not affected him in a way that he can't continue to develop and and become a normal little boy. One of my last questions would be for both of you. Uh, what kind of signs should parents look for or uh, to decide that I think something's wrong, I need to bring my child in. Because I know you may have wrestled with that, oh, it, it might be nothing. Is it worth bringing in? Are there things that, that a parent should look for to know, I better bring my child in? Um, ours was we just, Vito changed from a thriving kid to not in weeks. He had really lost all of his skills. And in hindsight, we probably should have brought him sooner. Um, but Vito was on the brink of crawling and he was no longer able to sit up. And if you look at pictures about two weeks before he held his head tilted to the right. And, um, we thought it was a weird little thing he was doing. We took a couple pictures. We were going to mention it's pediatrician, but at the end of the day, we had to trust our gut that we knew our kids. And that trust again is what got me from putting the car in park and yanking him out of the car seat because I still I can still look in that rear view mirror and remember battling that. Um, like Dr. Bendel said earlier, you're, you're your child's parent. You know when something's up and to do it. And I think the best thing is if you were to go there and it'd be nothing, and that's fine. The worst thing to ever feel is that if you don't go and it was something um, because that's something we wrestled with, me and my husband, forgiving ourselves for the little ear markers that we saw and just kept saying it's okay. So we're glad we took them in when we did. And I guess with your gut, because I Googled everything, where was our red flag? And there was no huge red flags that was like, get them in now. So. And, and that has to be, we have so much information at our fingertips. Is it is it tough as, as a medical professional to know that, there may be things that are just not true being being read and consumed on the web when when parents come in again it seems like this partnership uh forging a strong one would help battle against that it definitely does i mean there is a lot out of there that is just crazy um and does not apply to your child and so that's that's where it's important up front that you form a good relationship with the patient and their family so that they trust you and that they will come to you if they read something that they're worried might apply to their child um, and also educate the families up front so that they can do some weeding out and realize, okay, that really doesn't apply to Vito because he's not in that age group or he doesn't have that subtype or he doesn't even have that type of cancer. Uh, So I think that, that once again, having a good, strong team, um, educating the parents, making sure that they are part of that team is going to be crucial. All right. Uh, Is there anything else you guys would like to add? Just thank you, children. All right. And uh, thank you both for joining me. Nicole, we we greatly appreciate you telling us your story and and sharing all about Vito, who's now 17 months. Yes. 
I mean, I, I miscount. I call them the wrong names too sometimes. And and again, as one of four boys, <laughs> um, remain patient with your boys. They love you, <laughs> and they mean well. Anytime, uh, anytime they don't seem to be meaning well.